Okay, recording is on, so let's go ahead and go through some of these uh, practice test questions. All right. Um, one of the things I want to emphasize when you go through the test, and you should do this when you're going through the practice test also, and it does say here at the beginning, um, you should be doing your work on a sheet of paper, um, and you should have some work for every problem. And I'll show you what that uh, looks like. Um, but it, it makes things a lot easier, and also for the exam, you want to be able to submit work. So let me just show you, I'll, I'll write off to the side what I would be writing in my notebook. So for these first few where we're looking at a sequence, you know, I, I would write out the sequence. Um, and sometimes you can look at it and see the pattern right away. What I'm going to do for this is I'm going to show you the process that I use um, to figure things out. Um, so like even if you see it on one, you may not see it on another. So I'm, I'm just going to go through the, the process I use for uh, figuring out what the pattern is in a sequence of numbers. Okay. So the first thing that I like to do is to look at, you know, what are the differences? What do I need to do to the first number to get to the second in terms of adding or subtracting? So here the difference is 11. And then from 22 to 44, the difference is 22. And then here the difference is 44. And then uh, here the difference is 88. difference is 176. Okay. So if I was just looking at the differences, I could say that the difference is the previous number. Okay. And using that, I could say, okay, um, oops, I think the difference here will be 352. So I take 352, and if I add 352, uh, I'll get 704. Okay. However, in this case, um, you might have also noticed that, oh, it looks like what we're doing is multiplying by 2. Okay, so instead of looking at what we need to add, um, we could also look at what do we need to multiply. So here we have to multiply by 2, by 2, by 2, and they're all multiplying by the same thing. And that's, I think, a simpler way to get to 704. Okay. I always start at looking at, at what do I have to add, and then I have to look at what do I have to multiply. If I still don't see a pattern, then I look at the differences of the differences okay, and, and work up from there. Okay. So I'd have 704, and then I would go on. This add work business, um, I think that your best bet is probably to do each of your problems on notebook paper or something like that. You know, you don't, it doesn't have to be, you know, notebook paper, but do your work somewhere and keep it labeled, right? So I would, I will label this on my exam or on my, on my scratch paper as question one. And then after my exam, I would take a picture of this and I, and I would upload the work. You're allowed to upload the work even after the time limit has expired. So, um, you know, you can wait till the end if you're worried about running out of time. Okay, let's go through one more um, finding a pattern just to illustrate this process. Um, and I think this is a, a, a good one because it's not as obvious what the, the pattern is than, than just doubling, right? So... Um, once again, I would start at saying, you know, what do I have to add each time, right? What, what is the difference? So here the difference is 1, and the difference is 4, and the difference is 7, and the difference is 10, and the difference is 13. Okay, well, it's not the same number, and maybe it's not a real obvious pattern there. So now I go to, what do I have to multiply by? And what do I have to multiply three by to get four? So the way that I figure that out, oh, yellow is a bad color to write this. Okay, so if I take four divided by three, right? And then I have, I see I have to multiply by 1.33. Okay, to go from four to eight, I multiply by two. 
to go from 8 to 15, again, if I divide 15 divided by 8, uh, I get 1.875. And we can keep going here, but I'm going to look at this and see, like, not only do I not see a pattern, but these aren't even whole numbers. This looks really messy, so I don't think that the multiple, uh, multiples are going to be the way to go. Okay. So then I would go back down and I'd say, okay, what are the differences of the differences, right? So to go from 1 to 4, I have to add 3. To go from 4 to 7, I have to add 3. To go from 7 to 10, I have to add 3. From 10 to 13, I have to add 3. And now I see a, a clear pattern here. Okay. So in my differences, they're going to go up by 3 each time. So to get to the next one, I know I'm going to have to add 3. So if I add 3 to 13, I'll have 16. So I know that the next difference is going to be 16. So 38 plus 16 uh, will give me 54. Okay. And so that's kind of a, my systematic way for going through this, this finding pattern business using inductive reasoning. Um, you don't have to do things that way. I just, I just find that to be a, a pretty stable way to, to go about things. Okay, um, what kind of sentences are statements? So uh, let me go ahead and, and show you the notes that we have for that um, so that we can talk about why we get the answer we do. Um, So here's our notes on 2.1, and let's look at where it says what a statement is. Okay, premises and conclusions, inductive deductive reasoning. Maybe we did statements in 2.2. All right, here we go. Um, statement is a sentence that can be either true or false. Um, so things like questions are not statements. Im imperatives, if you're being told to do something, that's not a statement. Exclamations are not statements. Okay. So when we look at statements, anything that's a question is not going to be a statement. Okay, do your homework. Right. Telling somebody to do something is not a statement. It's not true or false. Okay. Um, if I say you did your homework, that can be true or false. Okay. But saying do your homework is not either true or false, right? All right. The class meets in the morning. It, it either does or it doesn't, right? I can say that that's true or that's false. Okay. And I know how to juggle. Okay. Maybe you don't know if I know how to juggle, but I either know how to juggle or don't, so that's that's a statement. Okay. So um, that's you know the the process of, of going through you know, statements. Okay, negations. Let me skip a little bit. I want to look specifically at negations where we have quantified statements. Okay, and there's um, So there, there's, they can be a little bit tricky, okay? Um, let's see. Okay. Um, so the quantified statements are all statements, some statement and no statement. You know, all some and no are, are, are our basic quantifiers, okay? And... When we want to look at the negation, we spent a little bit of work back in 2.4 looking at this. Um, okay. Um, so when we had something like 
all trees are tall, our negation was some trees are not tall. Okay. You want to be careful. I think that when you see all trees are tall, okay, or, you know, your instinct is to say, oh, the negation is that no trees are tall. Okay. But in a world where some trees are tall and some are not, then both the statement and all trees are tall and the statement no trees are tall, both of those are false. And if there's a possibility that both can be false, then they can't be the negation. Okay. So the way that we negate an all statement is with a saying that some things are not that thing. Okay. So So if we say that all A are B, the negation are, is going to be that some A are not B. Okay. So in this case, all trees are tall. My negation would be that some trees are not tall. Okay. So going the other way, you know, it makes sense if we say that some A are B. The negation would be that, well, all A are not B, right? It's kind of the same pattern here. Okay. However, in English, we have another way to say this, right? If I said that all trees are not tall, that would be the same as saying that no trees are tall. But if the negation of some ARB is that no ARB, then if I started with no ARB, then the negation would be that some A R B. Okay. So That means that we now have a few different scenarios that we can run into when we're negating qualified statements. Okay. So that there's a little bit of a pattern to it. Now, I'd rather have you understand what's going on and understand why this is true right, than, than recognizing patterns for sure. Okay. But I want, but I want you to see all of these cases, okay? And on an exam, um, it's not really time efficient, um, I think, to draw out all five diagrams, right? And go through the process that we did back in in two point four when we went through this in the notes. I want you to understand why we get the result that we do. Um, but if you're if you're drawing out five diagrams for every statement and then figuring out which ones are true and which ones are false for your statement, and then trying to come up with another statement that has the same, you know, that, that's, that can be pretty time consuming. That's probably not the best way to go on a test. Okay. Okay, so here are, um, some truth table questions. And this one is set up, um, I think, a little bit different than, than what you saw in the homework. Instead of filling in the true and false values, this is a matching where we say, OK, here are columns with true and false values. Find the simple connectives that, that match that. OK. Um, So get rid of that. there's a couple different ways to, to sort of go about this. Um, you know, one way is, is to essentially repeat the truth table, right? To say, okay, what does the and statement look like? What does the if and only if statement look like? Okay. Um, and I think that that's, that's probably a good way to go. Um, so let me go ahead and, and show you how to, how to fill some of these out. Um, the, the point of this is to remember 
um, um, you know, what are the rules for, for our, our connectives, okay? Um, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and write some of these out. So the first one is Q and P. So remember that this one is the and. Okay. The and statement is true when both of our simple statements are true. So when I have true and true, I get true. If either one is false, the and statement is false. So I get false, false, false. Okay. So then I find which one matches that. I have a true in the top row and falses in, in the rest. So that's column D. Okay. Um, for the next one, Q if and only if P, um, the if and only if is true when they match. Okay, so I'm looking at at Q and I'm looking at P. In the first row they match, so it's true. In the second row they don't match. I have a true and a false that's not a match. In the third row I have a false and a true not a match, so that's false. In the last row false and false match, so the if and only if is true. So I get true, false, false, true, and that matches in this case column A. Okay. The next one is P if and only if Q. Well, if I'm looking to see if they match, the order doesn't matter. So that's going to be the same. Um, and same thing is true with the AND statement. Q and P is going to be the same as P and Q. So I know that one's also column D. Okay. Um, the simple connective where order matters is the if then statement. Okay, so let's go through that one. If P then Q. The way that I like to remember this is I think of this as a promise. If you have P, then you will get Q. So in the case where you do have P and you do have Q, the promise was clearly kept, so it's true. If you do have P but you don't get Q, that's where the promise was broken, so that one's false. Okay. If I say, if you do P, then you'll get Q, and you don't do P, well, then I'm not breaking my promise whether I give you Q or not, right? Okay. So if I, if I tell my daughter, if you clean your room, I'll give you an ice cream, okay? She doesn't clean her room, nobody's surprised, but whether I give her ice cream or not, the promise was never tested, it was never broken. So we say, okay, it's default to true. All right, so true, false, true, true is column C. All right, um, I'm gonna skip down to the last one. If Q then P is not gonna be the same. I know that when I reverse the order on an if then, it doesn't quite match up. So I'm gonna be careful about it. Here we're starting with Q and then going to P. So if true then true, that's still true. If starting with a false is always true, the promise was never tested, so the second row is true. In the third row, we start with a true and end with a false. So we have the if part of the conditional, but we didn't deliver on the consequence, so that's when the promise is broken. And in the last row, we start with a false, so the if then statement is true. Okay, so true, true, false, true matches column B. All right, and then finally going through the or statement, um, P or Q, when either one is true, the or statement is true. It's only when they're both false that the or statement is false. So true or true gives me true, true or false, it's at least one true, false or true is at least one true. Okay, when they're both false, I get a false. And again, the order doesn't matter for the or statement, Okay, so I see this is column E, so that was P or Q, Q or P is going to be the same thing. Okay. Oh, 
Okay, so this is a slightly different truth table because what we're trying to do is construct a truth table for a more complex statement, and we have to do two things. It's two parts. The first is we need to figure out what is the process we need to use to get here. Okay, this is the statement I want, p if and only if not q, so that should be the last column of my, of my truth table. Okay, what I want to do to get there is I want to only ever do one thing at a time. So we usually start by saying if there's any simple statements with negations, let's throw those on there. So I know I need a not Q column. I don't need a not P column because it's never negated in, in my final um, statement. And then once I have a P column, which I start with, and I have the not Q column, which we said is next, then combining them with the if and only if is doing one operation on two existing columns. So I don't need anything else in the middle. That, that, that'll be enough. Okay. All right. So the way that we um, fill out a not Q, I just reverse the truth values for Q. So false, true, false, true. Okay. And remember the if and only if, we just tested that in the last question. We said, okay, do they match? So I'm going to look at the P column and the not Q column and say, do they match? So true, false, they do not match. True, true, that's a match. False, false, that's a match. False, true, that's not a match. So that gives me my truth values. Okay. And then what I want to do is explain this next part, uh, you know, just in case. I don't remember. Um, a contingent statement is one where we have a mix of true and false. Okay. Or another way to think about it is whether your final statement is true or false is contingent or depends on what you started with, right? Did you start with P and Q both being true or one true and one false? That's what's going to determine whether or not your final statement is true or false. Okay. A tautology is a statement that is always true no matter what you started with. So here, um, all rows are true. Okay, so that's a statement that's true no matter what. Okay, so if I say, you know, it will rain or it will not rain, it doesn't matter what's going on outside, what I said is true. Okay, so, you know, because I've, I've sort of listed every possibility in the universe. A contradiction is something that can never be true. Okay, it's a statement that is false no matter what the situation is. Okay, so here all rows are false. Okay, so it would be like saying it's raining and it's not raining. Okay, that's not possible, right? If you say something that's not possible, right, that's a contradiction. So this one has a mix of true and falses. So this one's going to be a contingent statement. OK, equivalent statements. Um, what we're looking at here is I'll, let me pull. At the end of section 2.7, we had sort of summarized uh, a bunch of things that we looked at. Based on truth tables, we said that these things are equivalent because they have the same truth tables. Okay. When we're looking at whether or not things are equivalent, you could fill out a truth table for both. But if I have five things here, okay, and it's not saying that this is equivalent to, right, there's like multiple possibilities, right? So it's very cumbersome to fill out a truth table to do this. So what we want to do is instead say, um, have we already done the work? Okay, that, that's kind of the direction we want to go here. So can I use my 
an equivalent statement reference to sort of simplify, right? Thinking of it like algebra, right? Can I simplify it down to figure out what this is equal to, right? And in logic, we say, okay, what is it equivalent to? Right. So this first one, um, P and Q is equivalent to, and it's giving me something that has a not P and a not Q. So when I look at my equivalent statement sheet, I say, okay, I want something where I start with an and statement, and then I end up with some, uh, some nots in there. Okay. So um, P and Q is equivalent to okay, something. And when I look at this, I say, okay, um, here I have an AND statement, and I have a not P, a not Q on the other side, okay? Um, but the thing is that things here are not going to exactly match off of our equivalent statement sheet, okay? what we're going to get is things that are close, okay? Um, so, one of the ways that we could look at this is we could say, all right, well, you know, here I have get my highlighter out. Okay, so here I have De Morgan's laws, and that and that looks like a good candidate. Okay, can I make it fit? Right? Can I get the pieces to work out just right? What if I don't start with a knot on this side? Okay, um, you know, does that does that still work? Okay, um, and and so that's going to be a little bit of of the challenge that you have uh, to work with. Okay. Um, so there, there's not like a, a one set way to go uh, to go about this. Just like in algebra, there's not like one set thing that you can do next, right? When I'm simplifying an algebraic expression, I don't say like, what is the next step that always works? I, I look at it and I'm familiar with my rules of algebra and I say, okay, well, what, what seems to make sense? So if I'm adding fractions, right, I can say, well, in the past, I know if I get common denominators, I can combine them together. One fraction is less, you know, is more simplified than two. Okay, right. But I, but I have to have some familiarity with fractions to do that. So the, the same thing is going to be true here. You really want some familiarity, but we don't always have that. So I'd look at this to Morgan's Law and say, well, can I make this work without a not here, right? What if it's just the P and Q? Okay, um, and I could say, well, you know, may maybe it's the other side of De Morgan's law that, that works. It. Okay, over here I have an and that doesn't have a knot in front. Okay, oops, my highlighter. Okay, so maybe what I want to do is instead start with this side. So here I have an and statement with two things, okay, and it's equivalent to something, okay. Um, so that's maybe another direction that we could we could look at. And if I wanted this to be a p instead of a not p, and this to be a q instead of a not q, I could maybe do like a substitution, right? I could say, okay, if I replace my not p with a p then I have to replace my P with a not P. And if I replace my not Q with a Q, I have to replace my Q with a not Q. So is this the thing I'm looking for? Not parenthesis, not P or not Q, okay? That would be something equivalent, okay? But I look at it and say, well, I don't, I don't have parentheses as an option, okay? I just have a not P, I have a not Q, and then I have to put some connective in between. Okay. So using De Morgan laws, I would say, well, that that doesn't that doesn't work. I can't really get an or statement out of this. Okay. And, and of course the and statement isn't going to work. 
So then we then we look at what else do we have? Okay. So let's look at other things where we have an and statement and then and then we have something else on, on the other side. Okay. Well, my highlighter again. There's only so many things that have an and statement in there. So that's one. Okay, with an and statement. Here we have, you know, an and statement, but it's just saying it's the same both ways. So that that's, you know, th these bottom three aren't going to be, you know, that, those are like really, you know, really basics, right? The symmetry and or if and only if uh, we can reverse the order. Okay, so maybe it's this conditional negation. Okay, let's see where that leads. Okay, once again, I want to start with P and Q. So let's. Um, replace not Q with Q, which means we replace Q with not Q. Okay, so what would this look like? On the right-hand side, it would be P and Q. On the left-hand side, the P stays the same, and we said replace the Q with a not Q. All right. Okay. Well, I say, all right, that's that's good and well, but now now what can I do with that? Um, I don't have parentheses to work with. Okay. So I say, well, is is there a way to get rid of the parentheses? Okay. Well, um, you know, you, you we, we can. Uh, We can look for another rule. Right? Okay, here we have our um, we look at a conditional exchange. We can look at, you know, other things. Okay, so the 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 idea that I'm trying to encourage here, right? I guess the the point I'm trying to get across is that you want to try things. OK, you don't have to go straight to the right answer. What you want to do is try things out. OK, you know, writing things out as we go. OK, oh, sorry, I didn't hear. Apparently the chat's not giving me things. Can we try uh, contraposition? OK, so yeah, let's go ahead and try that. So here, this says that I can, um, if I have an if P then Q, I can rep replace it, right, with its contrapositive. I, I swap the order and I also negate both of them. Okay, so then um, it's getting getting kind of messy here, but this would then be equivalent to I swap the order, right? So my not Q then P, and I put a negation on both. Okay, well, let's do another step. If I have a double negation on Q, that's just Q by itself. Okay. Now, we'll, we'll, let's just keep going with this. What happens if I have a not and I have parentheses and I have an if then, I can say, well, that looks like a conditional negation. So let, let's try that. Okay. So if I think of this as, as being like an algebra rule, right? It's a logic rule, but um, if I think of this as X and this is Y, okay, with a not on the outside, I can get rid of it by having the X and having a not Y. Okay. So here my X is like the Q. So I'm going to have a Q and 
my y is like a not p. So I want a not y, which is a not not p. Okay. So if I look at where I'm at now, I started with p and q, and I took myself into a big loop, and now I'm at q and p. Okay. Right. So I say, oh, well, that's come full circle. Okay. All right. So let me show you what to do if you can't figure out what rules to use, because that can be confusing, right? And this is kind of the first way to go. And I'll show you this in another example, but but I think it's really important to to look at what happens if I if I can't figure it out, if I don't know which rule to apply, okay, or or how to apply with you know which rule. So another way to go about this, um, and I wouldn't do this for all of them, but it's okay to do this for one that you're stuck on, especially on a test. Go ahead and create a truth table. Okay, so I know I have a not P and I have a not Q. So false, false, true, true, not Q, false, true, false, true. And then what we're going to do is we're going to try out um, the different connectives. So not P and not Q, not P or not Q. If not P, then not Q. Not P, if and only if, not Q. Okay, so let's fill out the truth table for each one. So the AND statement, I need both of them to be true to get it true. If either one is false, I get a false. Remember, I'm looking at these columns for all of them now. For the OR statement, either one being true gives me a true. When they're both false, I get a false. So here I have a true. Here I have a true. Here I have both true. Okay. The IF THEN is tricky, starting with the NOT P. If the IF THEN starts with a false, the IF THEN statement is true. If I have IF TRUE THEN FALSE, that's when we get a false. And if true, then true, then we're all good, that's true. Okay. Uh, the if and only if, we're looking to see if they match. So false, false, that's a match. False, true is not a match, right? Not a match. And here they're both true, that's a match. Okay. And I should have left myself a little bit more space, but we'll go ahead and sneak this in here. What we're comparing to is P and Q, right? So I'm looking for something that matches this, okay? Um, none of these four do, okay? All right, so in this case, I would say I don't I don't think that there is a right answer. I don't think there is one of these four connectives, right, that match. Okay. Um, and that's a little bit tricky. I don't I think that's probably a mistake or a typo or something. Okay. Um, but the point is that I would then submit this as my work for the problem and say, none of these four match our original one. Okay. Um, so I don't know, I'll leave it as a question mark, I guess and just submit that as your work. Okay, now that's what you do as like a last case scenario if you can't figure it out with the rules. So let me let me show you now how to how to get some of the rest of these using your rules. Okay, are there any questions on this first one? I think this is the only one where we're going to have a problem that, that's this bad. Okay. So let's look at the second one. Um, 
yeah, there's, there's no answer for the first one, right? Because in, in this pull down, there, there, there's no, there's nothing that's equivalent. Okay. For the other ones, I think that we're going to be okay, though. So if Q then P is equivalent to something with an or statement, so I'm starting with an if then, and I want to find something that's equivalent and includes an or statement. Okay. So when I look on my on my sheet here, I want to look for something where I have an if then on one side and an or statement on the other. Okay. And that looks like my conditional exchange. Okay. So this says if P then Q is equivalent to not P or Q. All right. What we need to do, though, is we need to make it fit. Um, we're not starting with if P then Q. We sort of have this reversed. Okay. So what we need to do is we need to say, all right, can I um, think of this? Don't get attached to the specific letters. What if I said if X then Y is equivalent to not X or Y? So I'm just changing my letters, no problem there. And here I'm starting with a Q. So I want my X to be a Q. I want my Y to be a P. So if X is Q, I replace my X with a Q, my Y with a P. So I'd say, oh, okay, if Q then P is equivalent to not Q or P. So what do I pull down? And I say, oh, not Q isn't an option here. I can't start with a not Q. But I know that an or statement, I can reverse the order. We could say that this is P or not Q. I say, oh, okay, P or not Q, and that'll be my answer. All right, does that make sense? So there might be more than one step. Um, just like with doing algebra and simplifying, you just kind of follow your nose. You say, what, what would be the next thing that I need to, to simplify? All right, let's look at this next one. I'm starting with an if then, and it's saying it's equivalent to another if then. All right. So I'm going to go on my reference sheet here and look for if then's on both sides, right? And so I have this contraposition and, you know, like things down here, I, I need three simple statements so that, that you know, that's going to be right out. Okay. Um, so I think that this is the only one where I have an if then on both sides. Okay. So what I'm going to do is once again, I'm going to, I'm going to rewrite this so that I can see it on my other screen, but instead of writing it with P's and Q's, I'm going to write it with X's and Y's. If x, then y is equivalent to, so the p is an x, so here I have an x, q is a y, so I have not, arrow, not. So I just rewrote my statement. You don't have to do the business with the x, y's, but if you're having trouble with substitutions, I find that this will help. Okay, so now what I'm starting with here is if q, then p. So my x is a q, so over here, my x is a q, and my y is a p. So I have if q then p is equivalent to if not p then not q. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I messed this up. <laughs> I'm looking at if Q then P. That, that's the last one we did, but that one's supposed to be an OR statement. All right. We're starting with 
if P, then not Q. So my X is a P. So I have not P. My Y is a not Q. So I have a not in front of here, and then the Y becomes a not Q. Okay. So not not Q, that double negation is just going to give me a Q. I want if Q then not P. All right, that makes sense. All right, these are a little bit hard. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going with them. Um, this next one I have I'm negating and then in parentheses I have an if then. Okay, so again, I'm going to go back to my, my reference sheet here, and I want to negate an if-then statement. Okay, so negation parentheses if-then. So negation parentheses if-then statement. That looks exactly like a conditional exchange, or uh, a conditional negation. So what I want to do is write down this rule so I can copy it over. I'm going to copy it down with x's and y's again. So not if x then y, x and not y, right? The q is a y. All right. So the statement that I'm given here is not if P then not Q, okay? So I want to have the same form here. X is P, so my X is a P, and not, the Y is a not Q. So again, I can say if you have a double negative, I know that that's going to give me uh, the positive statement. So not not Q is the same as Q. So I have not parenthesis if P then not Q, I know it's equivalent to P and Q. Okay, the last one we have a triple not, and you can look at this on your reference sheet, but you know, I think I think things like double negation are, are things that come pretty naturally. We know that a double negative gives me uh, you know, the original positive statement again. Okay, so not, not, not P, right? The not, not P just gives me a P. So this part is just the P. So I'm still left with one not on there. Okay. All right, any questions on this one? Okay, so like I, like I was trying to say with that first one, we don't really want to create truth tables here, okay, if you can avoid it. And for all of the ones that had answers, we were able to get there, I mean, without too much trouble, um, not using a truth table, okay? I resorted to, to, to a truth table on this first one because I couldn't figure it out, and I couldn't figure it out because there is no answer, okay? However, you might be in the situation where you can't figure it out just because the, you know, the substitutions are wonky or you can't see which rule to use or something like that, okay? So you can use a truth table as, as sort of a backup process, but that's not really the idea, right? The idea behind doing these is to say which... Um, you know, which rule, right, and that's what these are effectively, you know, do I want to apply here in order to um, move from one type of um, compound statement to another? Okay. Um, 
All right, a quick note on this, on the practice test, so that you can get feedback right away as you're working on it, these are all gonna be computer graded. The computer is super duper picky. When you take your actual exam, I go back through and I double check everything, okay? So like if you're writing something out and you like misspell something, right? And the computer marks it wrong because you made a spelling mistake, you get all the points back for that, right? So it's, it's going to be double checked on the actual exam you take, but you wanna be careful if you're getting it graded on the, on the practice exam because, uh, you know, the computer is only so smart, right? It's gotta, it's gotta, you gotta be pretty careful. All right, what we're going to look at in this problem is analyzing an argument, okay? So here's our example argument. If a student misses more than four classes, they will not be allowed to take the test. Kylie was allowed to take the test, therefore she's not missed more than four classes, okay? So we start by identifying the premises and the conclusion, okay? And again, the, the, you know, look for the keywords, right? I have therefore the conclusion typically follows. Okay, so there, there's my conclusion. Oh, here, I'll highlight it. Okay, so here's my conclusion. Okay, um, when I type it out though, I probably wouldn't say she, you know, I, I wanna type it out as a, you know, as a sentence that makes sense. So I'm gonna write Kylie has not missed more than four classes. Okay. So then my two premises are, are just going to be the, the two sentences that come before, right? So if a student misses more than four classes, then they will not be allowed to take the test. Okay, Kylie was allowed to take the test. Okay. What are the simple statements? Um, when, as I'm reading through, I can see the if, so that's a connective, but I have a student misses more than four classes. Okay, that's a simple statement. Okay, uh, not being allowed to take the test. So, not allowed to take the test. Okay, that's another simple statement. Okay, Kylie was allowed to take the test, okay? So what we wanna do is we wanna make this whole thing all about Kylie and then that's gonna be the same, maybe I should do it in a different color. Uh, that's the same simple statement again, okay? Um, so here we say not allowed to take the test and Kylie was allowed to take the test, okay? And my conclusion was about missing more than four classes. Okay, saying that that didn't happen. She did not miss more than four classes. Okay, so we only have two statements. It's about missing four classes and being allowed to take the test. Okay, so that's our simple statements, right? The first one, um, um, Kylie misses more than four classes. And Kylie is allowed to take the test. Okay. Um, we're going to just make it all about Kylie. All right. So use simple statements above to sim oh, get rid of that. To symbolize your premises and conclusion. So our first premise if a student misses more than four classes, so if P, then they will not be allowed to take the test, so not Q. So if P, then not Q. So I want an arrow, if P, then not Q. My second premise, Kylie was allowed to take the test. That's Q. My conclusion, Kylie did not miss more than four classes, so not P. Okay, since we're making it all about Kylie, we could back here say, instead of saying a student, we could say Kylie. All 
All right. Which one does this uh, match? Right. So if p then not q, I say, well, that doesn't exactly line up with any of these. But I could say it could still generally match one of these forms. Okay. So again, if I think about doing a substitution like we did when we were looking at the equivalent statements, okay, um, here I'm always having an if p then q right, as my as my first premise. Okay. So what I could do is say, well, if I think of like, you know, let me just write this out. Okay. Think of my P as being like an X and my Q is my not Q as being a Y. Okay. Then this would be if X then Y. Well, if not Q is Y, then Q is not Y. Okay. And P is X, so not P is not X. Like I say, does this match any of these? And you can either look at it, or if it really makes you feel more comfortable, you can switch back. Let's do another substitution and say that X is P and Y is Q. Okay. And now we can see if this one matches any of our um, standard arguments. So if P then Q not Q, therefore not P, matches indirect reasoning. Okay. So we have to be careful when we're doing substitutions like this. Um, it, it's nothing, there's nothing about the conclusion that it keeps it safe from from the substitution, right? When we when we substitute over, we substitute everything. So notice here that, that x was p, my conclusion also had a p in it. So it's, you know, x is p, so not p is not x, right? And that's why the conclusion didn't change, because I didn't really change the p portion. Okay. It was the not q that I changed into a y and then and then back into a q. Okay. So if you change things in the premise, you want to change those same things in the conclusion. Okay, we're just doing a substitution. We're, we're relabeling our letters. Okay. To figure out if this is valid or invalid, um, and back in our notes in 2.8, we went over some examples of valid arguments and some invalid arguments. Um, here, let me... Okay, sorry. I think I think I think we want to look at this in 2.6. In 2.6 we were using truth tables, but we want to see what were our results. Yeah, and that's where we had our common valid arguments. Okay. So, I can see here's six common valid arguments, and then we also had um, four common fallacies or or invalid arguments. So what we want to do is just say, well, does it match one of the things that we've already looked at before? Okay. And so we said this is um, indirect reasoning. Okay. If P then Q, not Q, therefore not P. Okay. If P then Q, not Q, therefore not P. And we, and we actually labeled it with the name indirect reasoning. So we can say, okay, that was one of our, our valid arguments. So I know that that one is valid. Okay. All right. That makes sense? I think that was the last. Yeah. That was the last one on the practice test.